I'm going to check this carburetor, Tech. I think all it needs is a good, thorough cleaning. That's all they usually need, Ken. But I've seen more things blamed on the carburetor than on almost any other part of the car. I don't want to stick my nose in, fellas, but someday I wish someone would explain to me how a carburetor works. You don't have to go any further, Duke. Ken's the guy who can give you this story. Well, you want to keep in mind that the carburetor has one main job to do. It mixes gasoline with air in the right proportion for all driving conditions. And the carburetor does that, whether the car goes uphill or downhill, fast or slow. You see, Duke, the carburetor has various systems that automatically provide for all types of operations. Well, what do you mean by systems, Ken? Well, let's take a look at where the whole thing starts. Your engine, for instance, is really an air pump. As the piston goes down on its intake stroke, it lowers the air pressure inside the cylinder. The atmospheric pressure outside pushes air in to fill it up. The pressure inside the cylinder, lower than atmospheric pressure, is referred to as a vacuum. Incidentally, atmospheric pressure is a powerful force. For example, if the air vent in the gas tank gets stuck, the fuel pump will cause a vacuum inside the tank, and the tank will collapse. But let's get back to that air that goes through the carburetor. It has to be mixed in with gasoline in the right proportion before it will produce the power you need to run an engine. The carburetor meters the fuel in proportion to the amount of air blowing through it, depending on the demands of the engine. Now, air enters here. The carburetor is divided into three sections. The top part is called the air horn. The center, the body, the lower part, the throttle body. Why isn't the inside straight all the way down? Well, that tapered part is called a venturi. It's there to speed up the flow of air at that particular point. This increase in airflow creates a slight vacuum right at the venturi. That's where the main discharge nozzle empties. The main what? Nozzle, Duke. Take this ball and ball carburetor. See those openings that look like fish eyes? They're the discharge ports of a passage from the carburetor bowl. Most of the gasoline used flows out of those two nozzle openings. Now, in the Stromberg carburetor, here's where that nozzle is located. The vacuum at the Venturi draws fuel into the airstream and helps atomize it so it'll burn faster. It's like the vacuum you get on the spray gun used for killing bugs in your garden, Duke. The air you push past the nozzle causes a slight vacuum at the nozzle tip. As a result, the liquid from the bowl is drawn up into the airstream. I see. Then this carburetor bowl works like that spray gun bowl. Yes. It supplies gasoline for all the systems, and it also controls the fuel level in the main nozzle by means of a float and needle valve in the bowl. One of the most common causes of carburetor flooding, Duke, is that float needle valve leaking. Right, Tech, and you can check that by simply disconnecting the fuel line and removing the needle valve and seat. Look for scratches or for little specks of dirt. Don't expect to find a hunk of coal in there. A tiny piece of lint, half as thick as a hair, can make it leak. If there's any question, put in a new needle valve and see. You'll also get a high fuel level if the float is damaged, so it leaks. You can tell that easy enough by ear. Just take the float out and shake it. That float level is one point to chuck when you're overhauling the carburetor. How do you do it? Easy, Duke. Hold the float up with your finger to close the needle valve and set the float level gauge across the bowl. If the level's wrong, then what? 
Well, if the float is set too high, it'll cause a high fuel level. That floods the carburetor and makes the mixture too rich. What happens if the level's low? The airflow through the venturi won't draw enough fuel. That causes a lean mixture, which starves the engine on acceleration or at low speed. Well, that takes care of the float system, Duke. So now let's trace the flow of gasoline through the main metering system. This system takes care of average driving from about 25 to about 70 miles per hour. It has a main metering jet and a passage to the main nozzle we talked about. Inside the passage, there's a vent tube. It has little holes through which air is bled. The air is mixed with the gas to help break it up so it'll flow easily. That tube's pressed in, Duke, and hardly ever has to be replaced. Okay. Now, what about the main metering jet? It's in the bottom of the float bowl, Duke, and screws into the main metering passage. That jet controls the amount of fuel flowing through the carburetor in proportion to the speed of the air going through the venturi. But remember, that hole in the jet is tapered and carefully flow tested to measure out an exact amount of fuel. Don't run a piece of wire or a drill through it to clean it out, because that'll ruin it. How about changing it for a leaner jet to get more gas mileage? Well, chances are it won't do much good. You'd get a leaner mixture, but you'd have to use more of it to maintain the same car speed. You see, that leaner-than-standard jet is designed for owners who consistently drive at altitudes of 2,500 feet or more above sea level, where atmospheric pressure is lighter. As a matter of fact, the jet that comes with the carburetor will give maximum economy for average driving. Well, if the jet controls the amount of fuel, what controls the amount of air? The throttle valve. It opens every time you step on the gas pedal. It's like a damper in a chimney. When wide open, it lets in a lot of air. When partly closed, it cuts down the flow of air. That air is clean air, too, Duke, because it's filtered by that oil bath air cleaner on top of the carburetor. Oh, I see, Ken. Now, I was just wondering how you can spot troubles in the main metering system. Well, at steady speed, you run on the main system almost exclusively from about 25 to about 70 miles an hour. So if your engine falters within that speed range, check the main system. Could be you're getting a lean mixture, maybe from a partially clogged main jet. Another thing, Duke, if the main jet doesn't sink because it's gasket is bad or the jet is cross threaded It'll make the mixture too rich. Now, Duke, you want to remember that the main metering system is designed to give the best performance with the most economy. There are times, however, when the engine needs a richer mixture, like a shot in the arm, whenever it's pulling hard or at very high speed. And that's where the step-up system steps in. But before we step into the step-up system, someone better step up and turn this record over. On the ball and ball carburetor, there's a step-up rod which raises and allows gasoline to flow through the step-up jet, in addition to that already flowing from the main metering jet. Normally, the step-up jet is held closed by the manifold vacuum. But whenever this vacuum drops due to sudden acceleration or high car speed, the step-up jet opens. Here's what happens. Vacuum in the step-up vacuum passage holds the piston down. But when the vacuum falls off, the spring under the piston pushes it up. This opens the jet and adds extra fuel to the mixture for maximum power. The Stromberg is built a little differently, Duke, but it works by vacuum, too. The main difference is that the vacuum holds the piston up, which allows the jet to stay closed. Can anything go wrong with the step-up system? Well, the most likely thing is the piston sticking so that the step-up jet is always open or always closed. Of course, if it's always open, you'll have a constantly richer mixture than you need. If it's always closed, you'll find that your top speed is limited and your car will feel dead on acceleration. Say, why not tell Duke about when the step-up piston seems to stick but is really all right? Good idea, Tex. 
On the ball and ball carburetor dupe, the bowl cover holds the piston down a little bit. When you take the cover off, the piston and plate move up and can bind. When you test the piston to see if it's free, be sure you hold it down a little. Then you can see if the piston travels up and down without binding. I get it. Now, can that rod get stuck in the jet? Yes, especially if it's been bent by careless handling. Then it doesn't seat. That means poor mileage, because gas leaks out into the main metering passage. Here's another place to check, Duke. If the gasket under that jet is damaged, or if the jet is cross-threaded when it's installed, it'll leak. Well, now I understand the main metering system, which works from about 25 to 70, and the step-up system, which supplies a richer mixture for certain conditions. But what about idle or slow speed? That's a good question, Duke. When the throttle valve is almost completely closed, as it is when idling, air speed past the main nozzle isn't fast enough to draw fuel out. So an idle system is added to give a bypass for fuel and air around the throttle. This system is like another little carburetor inside the big carburetor. Where does the idle system get its gas? From the main metering passage, Duke. It's metered through an idle fuel orifice tube. Air enters the idle system through a tiny air bleed and mixes with fuel. Then the mixture goes through the idle restriction on its way to the idle discharge port. Whatever you do, don't run a drill or wire through those restrictions or you'll ruin the whole carburetor. Here's one of the holes the idle mixture comes out of, that lower one. Hmm. It's a lot smaller than I expected. What's that slot right above it? That's another opening from the idle passage, Duke. It's there to enrich the mixture when you transfer from idle to low speed running. As the throttle valve opens, it gradually uncovers the slot, and the engine draws the fuel mixture from both ports. This adjusting screw, Duke, regulates the idle by controlling the amount of mixture passing through the lower idle port. Turning the screw in gives a lean mixture. Turning it out gives a rich mixture. You set the desired speed of idle with a stop screw. So the engine idles at about 450 to 500 revolutions per minute when the engine is warm. It's important to set the idle speed first, Duke. Then set the idle mixture. The best way to set engine idle is with a vacuum gauge. Suppose I have trouble adjusting the idle. What part of the carburetor should I look at? Well, a partially plugged or damaged idle tube will affect the mixture and cause a poor idle. An air bleed coated with carbon or dirt will make the mixture too rich. If you see that it's dirty, clean it with a solvent and blow it out with compressed air. Yes, and on older cars, look for wear on the throttle shaft. Air leaks there will upset the mixture and cause rough idle and stone. Put in a new shaft or replace the throttle body if it's needed. Don't forget to check the screws which hold the body to the throttle body. Be sure they're tight. If they're loose, you'll get air leaks at the gaskets and you won't be able to adjust the idle mixture. Well, it seems to me that the systems we've talked about should just about cover every condition. Nope. To speed up smoothly at low or medium speeds, we need an accelerating pump system. Basically, it's a pump that pushes an extra supply of fuel into the engine to meet the momentary needs of the engine for acceleration. As you accelerate, the pump piston is forced downward by the pump spring. This closes the inlet valve and pushes fuel out of the cylinder through the outlet valve. The fuel is then discharged in a steady stream through the accelerator pump jet. You can take the air cleaner off, work the throttle, and see that stream. If the pump isn't working right, you won't get the proper squirt for smooth acceleration. Now, if you get a flat spot as you accelerate in high gear at low speed, the first place to check is the accelerator pump system. Sometimes the leather on the piston gets worn, 
Or some dirt gets under the ball check valves and keeps them from working right. Now I guess I know about everything except the choke. Where does that come into the story? Well, Duke, the choke is designed primarily to help start a cold engine. That's because only a small portion of the fuel drawn into a cold engine becomes a part of the mixture. That means you have to pull more fuel in to get a charge that'll burn. The choke valve helps, Duke, by cutting off almost all the air. This increases the manifold vacuum, and then the engine draws all the extra fuel it needs. I see. Now, how does the automatic choke work? That's another story, Duke, and we'll talk about it later. The important thing about any choke, however, is that all parts must work freely. Okay. Now, what's the chief cause of carbureted trouble, anyway? Dirt. So if you can't find any mechanical cause, just give the carburetor a good, thorough cleaning. Disassemble it as far as you can. Remove the plugs, gaskets, and leather parts. Then soak the whole unit in a good gum solvent, such as acetone or lacquer thinner. Rinse it off with clean gasoline and blow out all carburetor passages with compressed air. When you reassemble, use new gaskets and leather parts. All right. Now, what adjustments are there? Well, besides those we've mentioned on the float, idle mixture screw, and the throttle stop screw, there are three accelerator pump stroke adjustments. All adjustments, plus a lot of good troubleshooting tips, are explained in this service reference book. Well, Ken, that's a pretty good story on the carburetor. But I still want to say that the best fuel economy adjustment you can make is on the driver. But that's another story in itself, so I'll scare up some new ideas on that and see you fellas later. <laughs> 